Let's turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I, I tell you, <laughs> Wednesday night, this is going to be a carryover from Wednesday night. If you were not here, you will not be lost, but you're not going to get all of it. I will ask you, if you would, please get Wednesday night's message. Uh, it is a necessity for all of us, me included. Uh, for this church. And I want you to, we simply entitled it, uh, Stop Believing Things Jesus Never Said. I'm going to carry it over this morning and begin it on the same note that we began Wednesday night. But if you were here Wednesday night, there's a whole host of other things coming your way uh, that was not heard. And so it is not the same message at all, but I, it was locked into my spirit. I couldn't let go of it. And as a result, we're going to dive right back into this thing here this morning. I will tell you that, uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm really, I'm angry this morning, though in my spirit and have been for several days, just angry at the devil, not at people, uh, not at a person, not at anything, but I'm angry at the devil for <laughs> because I'm seeing where the devil is succeeding in clouding the minds of Christians. He's already clouded the minds of those outside. I'm getting angry because not at a person. I'm not getting angry at, a, at an individual. I'm getting angry at the one who is perpetrating people's downfalls. Amen? Uh, you, you see, but the way to deal with the devil is not through uh, criticism. Uh, the way to deal with the, uh, not the way to deal with the devil is to destroy a person or to belittle a person or to, to tear down a person, talk about them behind their back, criticize them in any shape, fashion, or form. The way to deal with the devil is to gain knowledge of his schemes and then by correcting ourselves and readjusting ourselves to be more in alignment with God so that his power will be just fully 100% resonating in us and then surrounding us and then flowing through us. Can somebody say amen? Uh, we need, rev I'm telling you folks, and you know it, I'm talking to the choir, but, but we need revival in America, I think, like never before. And, and, and the reason, it is not an accident, it just didn't, we didn't wake up one day and the church is the way it is and it's weak, anemic, uh, anorexic condition that it is today. But little by little, Satan succeeded in re robbing the knowledge of God and the Word of God from being active in our individual lives life. And so therefore we're paying a high price. And, and, but I'm going to speak to this church personally. I'm going to tell you that in prayer yesterday, it was like a yo-yo a, a, a of a week in prayer. And I'm going to ex explain that because on Friday, on Friday, I'm telling you in prayer time, I thought heaven was going to fall down through this roof into this sanctuary. But I will tell you, just like somebody flipped a switch yesterday, yesterday in the afternoon in prayer, it felt like all of hell had opened up its gate and there was some sort of an evil presence that had literally hit into this house and into me. And I literally, I've shared this with Lacey, and I said, I tell you, I even cried out. I said, God, what is going on here? And the Lord spoke to me, and the Holy Ghost began to inspire within my heart. And he said, Reuben, uh, he said, because <laughs> you must understand that in ministering this message I'm going to talk to you this morning about is because you're getting down to the heart of the issue. And Satan and his dark minions is not ignorant of what that church could become if it hears what thus saith the Lord says. And he said, the reason for it, do not be shocked that adversity is hitting your life or do not be shocked because you sense the evil power coming against you. Always remember, or remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And at that moment when you speak the name of Jesus Christ, do you know what Satan does? He leaves. <laughs> Glory to God. And so I, I, I'm going to take my time. I want this to really sink 
in to us this morning. It's not going to set well. It's not an angry message because I want to ask you a question. I want you to be serious. How many, it may sound rhetorical when I ask this, but I want you to think about this. How many want this church, and I'm not saying we don't want another church to succeed. We do. I, 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 that's not it. I'm just talking personally. And those watching by television this morning, I, I'm talking your church, your church. How many want this church to succeed? <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time. How many want to see? They I, I'm saying, Don't just flippantly say, oh yeah, I want it. Because we're going to get down into actions here in just a moment. But how many really want to see Mount Calvary Tabernacle really become spiritually successful for Jesus Christ? And then we'll do all that we can to ensure that success. Amen. So we're basically all in agreement. Amen. Okay, all right, all right. Just got to make sure. Because if we really, you say, well, pastor, that's a dumb question. Everybody wants to see their church succeed. Uh, that's not true. Some people will come to church as a bystander who can't wait till it collapses or find some juicy gossip so they can tear it on down a little bit more. Okay, so now uh, let's look at 1 Timothy 3.15 and I'll show you why we're there in a moment. Look at verse 15. Let's all read together. Reading out of the King James Version. If you have another, we'll, we'll all arrive at the same spot. But verse 15, ready? But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now we can stop there a moment. So there is a certain behavior that is expected in the house of God. <laughs> just, just saying. That's what he says right there. And we also know that we all are individual houses of God. Temples. So there is a certain behavior individually that we all should act. And there also is a certain behavior in the house of God as well, right? Amen. And people will say, well, the church of God is not a building. And that is true. The church of God is people, right? But never take away that even in the time of Jesus, he was very adamant that there was a place you went. It was the temple of that day. And he was very adamant, and he got emphatic, that when you were in the temple, in a building, in, at least in the courtyards and, and the surrounding area, that once you crossed over, it was a place designated for certain behaviors. Is that right? What did he say? He, he was angry at the money exchangers and basically said, in the ha listen, there was nothing wrong with exchanging money that day. Now, the extortion wasn't right, and he was angry about that as well. But there was nothing wrong. You had to exchange money before you went in. You had to change the denarii and so forth into the temple shackles and so on and so forth. That had to happen. The problem was, in the temple was not the place to be doing such behavior. Is that right? Okay. In other words, beforehand, I wasn't going here, but just to explain my little thesis here, or dissertation is, that prior, years before Jesus had to do this, years before that, in the main thoroughfare in Jerusalem, coming to the temple, lining those streets, or that street was the, was the what do you call them, the, uh, those fellows, the uh, business fellows along there, and the money exchangers, there's a word there, I lost it. But anyway, you would stop and exchange your money and exchange it for the temple tax and so forth so you had something to give when you got inside. That was fine. You were smoking. Now they extorted. That wasn't right. But it had to take place. And so when you're on your way, you did all of that on the outside. That way when you got on the inside, all you had to focus on was not the noise. All of that should have shut down. Now it was just worshiping God and giving to the Lord. I will contend with you that even in a house, uh, and then he, what else did he say? He said, you, you've made it a place of merchandise. He said, my, my father's house shall be called a place of prayer, a house of prayer. Do you know the leading thing, activity in a church, in a building that's designated as a house of worship should be prayer. The Word of God, prayer, all of this. Amen? And so, uh, in other words, it is wrong to turn the building that's designated as God's house into, I'm going to say it, don't get mad, I'm just telling you, it's wrong to turn this building into a YMCA. I'm just, is there anything wrong with YMCA? No! But leave YMCA down there and let's leave God's house as a place of worship. 
Thank you for those amens. Which is the church, let's read on. Which is the church of the living ground, or living God. Ready? Read the rest with me. The pillar and ground of the truth. Oof. So if we are the pillar, that's us. This, this is us. In the entire world, we are the pillar and the ground of truth. So if this place, now all places of worship, but I'm just speaking right here this morning. If this place falls apart, then that means that the local community has lost an anchor point to hold on to something substantial. The, the, the community has lost a, a, an influence for God. Yeah. Right? Now, <laughs> I will tell you that the church as a whole in America, if it loses the truth of God, then it loses a foundation and the pillar and the strength of God in this nation, then this nation will implode in on itself. Because when the church of God loses the power of God, the nation suffers as a result. Yeah. So we pay a high price. Uh, if this house here even, the, the community will pay a high price if this church would dissolve. So that it behooves us individually to do all that we can to ensure it becomes more solidified, empowered in the presence of God. All right, all right. I'm just trying to get us all on board to understand. Now, I'm going to come back to this. And the, one of the things, and it's several of it under it as a subtitle. The Lord brought to me, and uh, two weeks ago, and I shared this on Wednesday night, that we have to stop believing things that Jesus never said. <laughs> I'm going to take us right down this little part one more time. We all agree that actions speak louder than words. <laughs> we always say that, right? And it's true. It is. Actions speak louder than words. In other words, <laughs> pardon the pun, but if I, if I say to Brother Donnie that I believe something and then I do something different, what will he believe? He will believe my actions over my words. Okay? Now, actions do speak louder than words. Actions actually prove what I believe. As a, as a matter of fact, I will do what I believe. <laughs> if I don't do what I believe, it is going to be proof I don't believe it. Are we still on the same page? All right. Actions is the fruit of faith. If there's no fruit, there's no faith. <laughs> All right. Let's break it on down. In James, didn't James even say that? That our works, <laughs> faith without works. What is that word works? Faith without deeds and actions is dead. All right, I, I'm just, mm. I, I don't want you to get upset. We're, we're really, it's going to come down to this. So actions are simply the result of what we believe. All right, now let's turn to Mark 17 one more time. Look at Mark 17. I want to show you this. <clears throat> now, as we say this, actions speak louder than words. The world does not know the Bible. Well, they do know this verse. They know this. Matter of fact, I just told this by a sinner just the other day. I just the other day, as a matter of fact. They were going to do something they shouldn't be doing. And they saw me. I don't even know what the proper English is here. They saw me looking at them. And they looked at me and said, I didn't even say a word. Said, I was smiling. I knew what they were going to do. And they was looking at me and they finally said, don't judge me. Amen. The world does know this verse. It's, it's found over there in Matthew 7. I mean, you know, uh, it's called judge not that you be not judged. Now that's the verse they know. But the Bible, or the world doesn't know the Bible. Do you know how they get to know the Bible? I will tell you it's more than just us speaking. We speak to them, they get bored. If you want to preach to the world, let your actions do a whole lot of talking. Amen. As a matter of fact, how we act 
will tell the world what Jesus said to us. Am I right, Brother Ron? So how I act is telling the world Jesus must have said that because they're doing it. Amen. Oh, I tell you, it's a, it's just... <laughs> See, I know where we're going. You don't know just yet. Some of you do. Look at chapter 7 here and look at, look at verse 1 and 2. Then came together, this is in Mark 7, 1 and 2. Then came together unto him the Pharisees. How many knows who the Pharisees was? The religious crowd and certain of the scribes. Well, they were part of it. They were doctors of the law. Which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, and again, just to refresh your memory, this wasn't talking about sanitation here. It wasn't because they didn't use soap and water and clean your hands like we teach our children before they eat food and all of this. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the, the regimen and the rudiments of religiosity that had taken the place of God's prescribed righteous prerequisites and so on. And they had attached called the Mishnah and the, the oral law, they called it. And they had taken the old Mosaic law and attached a whole other stipulation, bunch of stipulations to it. And, and so, and, and, and part of those stipulations, before you could eat, you had to dip your hands so many times in this certain pot set apart, certain water that was hallowed for it. And, and it wasn't because of washing dirt. It was, you had to do it because they said it. Well, God never said to do that. And, and so, uh, this was the problem. And now, read the last three words. And don't be timid when you read it. Ready? They... Oh, see that we're getting quiet on it. <laughs> Let's just say it one more time. Ready? What did they do? They found fault. Well, that's an easy thing to do. Finding fault. Here is one thing, and I said it Wednesday night, but I'm going to start it out today again. Evidently, a lot of Christians believe that Jesus said we should find fault with one another. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. No Christian will say that. That's ex 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 exactly right. And they'll not say it, but our actions speak louder than words, and our actions betrays our heart in saying what it believes. Our actions will prove. So if I'm finding fault with other people, then evidently it is something I believe is okay to do. Boy, I could just, boy, they're just, it just, it's going out the window right there. Somebody shut the window. We got to keep it all in here. You see, folks, uh, if the world is watching us, and are they watching us? You better believe it. If the world is watching us and don't know the Bible, and our actions is that we're finding fault with one another, they will get the mis. Uh, no more about that well uh, you know what then Jesus must have said find fault because his church is always busy finding fault now I got a news bulletin for you here it comes do you know everybody in here we all share this in common all of us share this in common everyone I know you're not gonna believe it I know when you go home today so I don't believe that what he said but you're gonna Everybody in here, guess what, has faults somebody can find fault with. <laughs> well, pastor, you don't, oh yes. If Brother Garland spent a week with me and never left my side, do you know, brother, if he wanted to, okay, I'm just, uh, just stay with me now. <laughs> I said this on Wednesday night. Jesus did say, seek and ye shall find. That was on the good side. But the principle is still applicable in everything. Whatever you look for, believe me, you will find it. Okay? Now, if he spends a week with me and on my heels every day, if he was looking to find fault, he told Sister Garland, I tell you what, I, I just know. I, and there's, I tell you something. And do you know if he went in with that mindset, do you know by week's end, he probably wouldn't have one. He'd probably have a grocery list and come back to Sister Garland, boy, he ain't the guy you thought we, he was. <laughs> now, here's, here's, now here's the news breaker. If I followed Brother Garland around for a week, and Sister Garland says, no, you'll never find it. Well, now wait a minute. 
If, if I followed Brother Garland around for seven days and I went into it the mindset, I'll tell you what, Lisa, I know, I know he's got faults. You know, going in with that mindset, do you know that by the week's end, I'd probably only find one, but I'd find one with him. And, and, and I'd come and say, you know what? i tell you what, what you do? I found fault with Brother Garland. Do you know something, folks? Jesus never told us to find fault with one another. Now the question then becomes, why is churches filled with fault finders? Well, don't shout me down. And then I'm going to ask you a question. If I'm doing that, I have to ask the question to myself, why am I doing it? Why would I feel the need to find fault with other people? Because, listen, be, really, I have enough on my own plate. I should be more interested in keeping myself. Amen. In other words, I should be first the most critic. I should be the most critical of myself before ever looking anywhere else. Amen. Jesus said, he said, why do you see a big log stuck out of that guy's eye and you have no, you can't even see the little splinter dust in your own eye. He said, what you need to do is get it out of your own eye first. <laughs> you say, well, wait a minute. I don't believe that. Nobody will say, Jesus said found fault. But our actions speak louder than what we are saying. And the world has to see it. Listen, we can all find fault. Let's just clear the air. We all can find fault with each other. <laughs> I'll tell you, somebody look at me, I don't know. Oh, come down a peg. You're all right. It'll be okay. I'm not talking about open sin. I'm not talking about living like the devil and those sorts of things. But I want to tell you something. When we start looking at each other, and it's just like the Pharisees, why did the Pharisees find fault? Because they created their own standard that was apart from the Word of God. When I start holding people to my standard, then instead of God's standard, I will find fault with everybody. Why? Because there's no two people just alike. Amen. Well, I'm about to launch into something else. I almost let it out. Hold on. We need love to really flow in the house. You know why? Because love is like, <laughs> you like this, love is like grease between moving parts. You know why? Why is there grease between moving parts? It keeps those parts from irritating each other. <laughs> Some of you get that tomorrow morning. <laughs> People, we are members of the body. <laughs> you have joints that operate the same way. Those joints are lubricated for what reason? So there is an irritation. So you can have freedom of movement. It is the same way in the body of Christ. Love is that between the joints. We're all jointed together, but something compacted, as Paul told in Ephesians, something though holds us together and keeps us in good working order, and it is called love. If love is not there, we will irritate each other. This is why in some churches, some people can't sit on the same side as another person sits. Why? They irritate me. I can't sit near brother. No, oh, we're crucifying Donnie today. I'm sorry. But <laughs> somebody's got to do it. <laughs> but, but you see, I, if I came in and, and Donnie just, just things he does, just, <sighs> I tell you, Lisa, I can't even sit in there. I, we got to sit in the back. I can't stand it. Well, what, something's wrong. You know what it would be? If that really was the case, there's nothing wrong with Donnie. There'd be something wrong with me then I'm not operating in love. My love should be like an absor absorbing shock in between us. In other words, letting people, everybody here is a little bit different than the next person. Amen. Some people will, do, I know some people do dumb things, but, they, but they'll look at you and think you do dumb things. Yeah, true. <laughs> oh, here we go. I'm going to say, it's going to, I mean, this is going to be a bomb right here. And, and it's, and it ain't going to get any better. There isn't a mature Christian on the planet. All right, I'm going to say it again. I got, oh, this has got to come out. There isn't, and hear these words now. He'll hold it together. There isn't a mature Christian on the planet that has caused a problem in a church. 
All problems that have ever been caused in a church is the result of sin and or immaturity. Mature Christians don't cause problems. Well, they've been saved for 30 years. I don't mean they're mature. <laughs> Do you know you can have immature preachers? Don't, don't start. <laughs> I'm telling the truth, though, Evan. Just because somebody has an office don't mean that's maturity. Just because somebody comes to church every week doesn't mean that's maturity. We've got to understand that mature Christians do not cause problems. Let me ask you this. Is it possible to have a... How many knows the world says this all the time? I tell you what, that church is full of gossipers. Jesus never said to gossip. And yet the church is full of gossip. So the world thinks, well, Jesus must have said it. No, he didn't. But I'm going to ask you a question. Is it possible to have a church where gossip is near zero? Yes, it is possible. Our favorite saying should not be, I heard. Or, did you hear what... Our favorite saying, it shouldn't we really talk what we know, not what well, somebody said. Amen. Amen. Whew, my, 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 my. Proverbs 26, 20. You got to look at it. You got to look at it. I, was, I didn't put it on the wall today, and I probably should have to move along quicker, but that's all right. Let's let our fingers do the walking here, and right in the middle of your Bible, look at Proverbs 26. Twenty. Twenty-six twenty. Just simple. It's two plus two. I want you to read it with me if you would. Proverbs twenty-six, verse twenty. Oh boy. Are you ready? If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay. Here we go. Ready? Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Maybe we better stop there. Now, is that, that's just simple stuff, ain't it? How many knows if you have a fireplace at home, the fire goes out? Why? No wood. What's the wood doing? Supplying fuel for the fire. <clears throat> so where, let's read the rest. <clears throat> let's clear our voices before we do it. <clears throat> All right. So where there is no the strife ceaseth. So that means if there's division happening, there evidently is wood for the fire. So if the tail bear, I like that word tail bear in the King James. I, like I know it means gossip and all of that. But a tail bear means it's a person who carries tails. That's what they do. That's their occupation. That's what they do. They're occupied with carrying news. Have you heard? Did you see? All right, look over here. There's another one. Look at 1310. Now, we want this church to succeed, right? All right, I'm, I'm going to put it on to us here in a minute. 1310. 1310, same book, Proverbs. All right, let, let's read this now. Now, notice that first word only. He said there's no other way. He said it's, only, it's coming this way. Only by what? By pride cometh what? But with the well-advised is wisdom. Now, there's a lot to that verse. It's a little unseen right there. We could really dig in. But let's just look at the principle. Only by pride cometh contention. So when pride now is supplanting love in a person's life, when they are causing division, because pride is the only way that it's caused... Do you know love is very flexible? Because you know why? True agape love is, I don't always have to have my way. All right, I'll say a little bit better. Love doesn't always have to have its way to be satisfied. Well, if I don't get my way, well, I'm leaving. 
No. Let me ask you this. Well, it's not a question really. One person is not the church. I am not this church. One person sitting here, Mom Molly, Janetta, <laughs> is not this church. Guess how many, all of us individually are making up this church. Every one of us. That means all of us, not just one person here or here or there, not just one person is responsible. That makes all of us responsible to the health of the spiritual welfare of this house. It demands that all of us put a hundred percent effort into this place being a pristine spiritual environment. Amen. We have all been entrusted with the care of each other and this place. Amen. Am I saying anything off kilter? No, this is the truth. Now, <clears throat> that takes the blame off of everybody else. That means I can look in the mirror and say, I have a part in this to play. You see, every person here, let's just cut through the mustard, they say. Every person here, all of us, every person here would, would probably run the church or at least some aspect of it differently. Well, it's, I'm telling you, it's coming right down. I mean, but listen, I'm not... I'm not preaching for man's opinion. I, re I received every bit of this right in prayer, right out here, and this is for this church. We say we want this house to be full of God's, and His presence is here. And we've seen such spiritual movement. But I will tell you, we need to get higher than where we are. Amen. So I'm not preaching for, and I'm not being mean, and I'm not, this is not being nasty. It's just being the, mail, the mailman for what it is. Everybody here, if, I, if you would take a survey and go around, well, what would you do differently? You know, if there's a hundred people, do you know, you know, it's very possible we can have a hundred different opinions. Amen. But how many knows all 100 opinions is not going to be done? Well, I, well, I'll tell you now, you know, now wait a minute. When I see something, and let's say, and again, I'm not talking about sinful things. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about, well, I'll tell you what, I would just do it. And it's, no, it's, no, it's not wrong to have an opinion. So we're not saying that. We're not robots. We can have a right to our opinions. But there comes to a place where if my opinion is causing division, I've got a decision now to make. My, de my decision to make is, what am I going to do about it? And the Lord laid in my heart, there's three things. Let, I'm talking about me even. If I'm sitting right here in a pew, just like everybody else, I'm sitting right down, and I'm a part of this congregation, and I am as a pastor anyway, I'm just, I'm a part of the, now, I see something, well, I'll tell you, I don't know, when, uh, hmm, uh, and it starts to irritate me. I have three things I can do. Number one is the best. You know what the first thing is? I should pray. Amen. Number one, I should pray. But there's three things, three options people will do. Number one, I should pray. And I'm telling you what, and it's not always that I should pray that someone else should change or the situation change or the church change. Sometimes I need to go into prayer and say, Lord, is it I? See, pride has to leave. Well, I can't be wrong. Well, I might be wrong. You see, I, it's not about, I need to see. <laughs> go into prayer. Say, and a lot of times, we don't even acknowledge it. We'll go right in. Lord, you got to change this person. you got to change this. you got to do this. And God, do it. and God is sitting there thinking, uh, I wish you would pray because uh, uh, that you need to change. I want to change you. That's the way it is in marriage, too. Did you know that? Amen. Sometimes it's not always the other person's fault. Amen. She wasn't supposed to say amen to that, but I heard it. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> you know what the number two option people do is? You know these well when I see it. There's a third one, too, but number two. I'm sitting here, and I see something that's irritating me, but instead of praying... I get up and I run over and I tell somebody else about it. And I vent and I spew it out and I tell him, Brother Garland, I tell you, this is irritating me. And you know what I'll do to him? I'll get him worked up. 
I'll get his blood pressure going. Oh, I didn't look at it that way. Oh, I think you got a point, uh, Brother Reuben. And then he runs over to Donnie. While we're on Donnie, we'll keep him in the flow. And he, Brother Garland, Donnie, did you? Uh, Reuben told me, oh, I never saw it like that. And Donnie gets worked up. Well, that's right. Oh, I didn't see it that way. And then he runs over. Well, we got Jeanette in it. We'll keep her in it. And he runs over. <laughs> People, don't pray for them. They're okay. I'm just using them. All right. And so he runs to Jeanetta and said, Jeanetta, I'm telling you, did you? Uh, Brother Garland told me and Reuben told him and now I'm going to tell you. And then she gets, well, no, let's, let's get her really sanctified. Let's, let's have her. She's a prayed up, mature young lady. Yeah, now we're, see, we're doing it now. And she says to Donnie, Donnie, don't you think maybe you don't know the whole story? And maybe you ought to pray about it. And she stops it right there. Amen. Well, who's responsible? Every one of us is responsible to do that. See, Donnie again. Now, we're getting him saved after the service. But, but Donnie, the moment he heard it from Brother Garland, he should have stopped it. The moment Brother Garland heard it from me, he should have stopped it. As a matter of fact, I have a personal responsibility. I should have been mature enough to go to pray about it first. See where no wood is. All right. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came this morning? Sorry, if you don't like this morning, come back tonight. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> number three. Here's my number three option. I should have prayed about it, didn't. I'm st I, I told somebody else. Now I sit here and I don't tell anybody. I just sit. I just sit and I stew. Does anybody ever know what I mean? That's Green Castle lingo. You know what I'm saying. Even Chamber. Uh, it just, I sit and stew on it. And the next thing, I used to come into church like, yes, whew, glory to God. This is the day the Lord has made. Shake Brother Don's hand when you come in. Whoa, this is the day. And the next week, it, you come in and say, huh, well, how you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing all right. The next week, boy, it just keeps getting worse. How you doing today? I don't know. I'm here, ain't I, Brother Don? <laughs> just stewing, stewing. What's wrong? What's wrong with you, Reuben? Hey, don't tell a word. Don't say a word. Just sit and stew and stew and stew over it. And finally, you know what happens when you sit and you stew? You're fermenting. <laughs> <laughs> and when you ferment, what happens when you ferment it too long? Huh? Yeah, it gets sour. Woo! And then it'll blow up. That's why Jesus said, now they used different the bottles, but back then they used them uh, uh, skins. And he said after a while, it'd blow them out. See, that's what happens to us. If we stew and we vent, well, honey, you won't cover it forever. After a while, it'll be like an old boy. Boom, there it goes. And you know what happens? The person, I'll use myself. If that's me sitting there, eventually I don't destroy anybody else. I destroy myself. That's just like you hear the old adage now, and it's, it's very true. People can't forgive one another, and, and they'll be oh, hot, resentful, resentful and, and, and not forgiving. Oh, my goodness. Uh, unforgiveness is true. You've heard this saying. It's like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die from it. I'm the one that will die from it. When you see Saul in the Old Testament, not going there for Samuel and so forth, but when you see King Saul, and you know, this, this thought, the Holy Spirit brought it to me, and, and I wrote it down. He said, you know, all of the fits, you remember Saul, all of the fits of rage, jealousy, and misery. Do you know all of that in Saul's life could have been avoided, and his future totally rewritten, and our reading historically could have been a beautiful picture of King Saul? Did you know that? But do you know the problem with him was? What happened? <laughs> Pride got in him and elevated him. And therefore, he began to look at everybody else and find fault with David when really it wasn't David's problem. Saul should have looked in the mirror and say, Lord, is it I? Hmm. Here's another one. Jesus, well, I, I'm going to come back to that one. Just, just I, I might as well... I might as well get to this one. I'm, while we're on this thread, I'm going to skip to the end and go backwards. Turn to John 21. <sighs> Does anybody have a roast on this morning? 
If you do in your oven, I hope you only put it on 200 degrees because it's... <clears throat> Just stay with me here, though. Don't forget to get Wednesday night. But here's another one that's new. Now let's read here uh, chapter 21. Uh, I'll read for a little bit and then I'll, I'll get you on board. Verse 18, I'll read this. Now this is Jesus talking to Peter. Verily, verily, I send thee. Verse 18, chapter 21, Gospel of John. Verily, verily, I send thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and others shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. He's simply telling Peter that uh, when you're young, you, you, you'll get to do what you want to do and go where you want to go and without assistance. But when you're old, uh, you're going to go where someone else has destined you, destined you, which was Jesus Christ. There's a whole other thing with that, dealing with love and loving Christ like Christ loved him. We've already dealt with that. Verse 19. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, just simply two words, what did he say? Follow me. Follow me. In other words, that's your business. Follow me. Well, then, <laughs> then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple. Now, now, right away, he disobeys God. Right away, his knee-jerk reaction is, Jesus said, follow me. Follow me means that Jesus is all I'm concerned about. What's he do? He turns around and sees another disciple, whom Jesus, which is John, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which, which is he that betrayed thee? And, and Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, uh, what, what shall this man do? What was he going to do? <clears throat> Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come. Oh, I love this. This is sweet Jesus getting sarcastic. Read with me. Ready? What is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. That ain't what Jesus said. Yet Jesus said unto them, He shall not die, but if I will be, will he tarry until I come? What is that to thee? What was Jesus saying? You know what I'm, you know I'm going to say. Jesus never said to mind everybody else's business. But the world is hearing a gospel through our actions that he evidently said that. You see, here is a classic example. And Jesus said, uh, basically, this in a very nice way, but sarcastically, Peter, in other words, uh, mind your own business. If I said to John, you're going to live till I come back again in, in the rapture, uh, he said, what is that to you? In other words, it ain't none of your business. You just concern yourself with your walk. You have enough to deal with. <laughs> oh, help me, Lord. I don't. Do you, even Paul wrote about it, that we should mind. He said it a little different way, but he basically said, he said, we need to mind our own business. Do you know we don't need to know what everybody else is doing around us? I'm going to say it. I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to say it. I've actually, as a pastor, I've had people get mad at me. I'm not, not a joke. Mad. Upset. Huffed. Because I went on vacation. And I didn't tell them where I was going. <laughs> oh, there's no joke. No joke. Where are, you, where, where, are you, where are you going? I didn't say where I was going. Now, there's nothing wrong. If I want to tell somebody, hey, I'm going here, I'm going there. There's nothing wrong. I'm not saying that. But, but, but why does people get mad when they don't know where somebody went on vacation? Now, you think I'm joking, but this is a fact that I'm telling you. I've had people get mad at me and say, uh, uh, where's he going? How come he don't say where he's going? Because, read my lips, it's not anybody's business. Where are we at? I'm losing my way already. See, if what is that? That is demonic distraction. Do you know what that is? That's drowning in shallow water. 
Some of you get that tomorrow morning. You know, you can drown. Can you drown in shallow water? Yes. You can drown in your bathtub. You can drown in a couple inches of water. Do you know why people drown in, in water like that? Do you know why people drown in shallow water? It's because they fall in. They just don't get up. Is <laughs> that the right? They just they fall in, but they don't get up. We all face shallow waters, mundane waters of adversity in our life and temptations and Satan throws them. Do you know, I want to be serious with you. Satan can't drown you with some deluge or whatever and you, you have nothing to do about it. Every day we walk in shallow waters of adversity. Every day. Amen. And how many weak Christians unnecessarily fall into the water, flounder around, and don't get back up. And we look at that, and some mature Christian may look at that and say, How, what is wrong? Why is that destroying their life? It's so shallow. It's because they have fallen in it, and they're not getting up. In other words, they have succumbed to a very small distraction by Satan, and now it's enveloped their life. A couple inches is destroying their life. When people say these things, you know, and minding other, listen, we have enough to be concerned about. Let's mind our own business and we'll be, listen, this is what Peter, Jesus telling Peter, walking Jesus at the wall over there and we start out through the gate over here of salvation. We are maturing, we're walking to becoming more and more like Jesus. But along the way, you know there's distractions everywhere and what happens is, here's a person doing something and next thing you know, Peter is going to look over John and what you look at, you go towards and you stop progressing towards something else. And the moment that happens, I get more concerned about, you know, Mum Molly, Don to hear Jeanette or whoever, and I get, well, what are they doing? Oh, what is it? What is it? And, oh, and next thing you know, I'm more worried about them. And if I'm worried about somebody else and their business unnecessarily, then I'm starting to neglect my own life. And my own life will become weak as a result of my attention on the wrong people and the wrong things. I've got to stop doing what Jesus never said to do. We, you know, a church cannot be the fire and the powerhouse of God if we ignore the very ABCs of Christianity. We can shout till we're blue in the face, but if we're running around and if we're gossiping, minding everybody else's business, finding fault, we will never reach the potential God has for us. Well, I thought you could just shout anyway. <laughs> Israel tried that in the Old Testament, and the Bible records it was basically empty religious shouting. I don't shout just to shout. I want it to really mean something. <laughs> I've seen people shout all over the place, hang off chandeliers, and I mean, you thought, boy, heaven came down, and, and, and the next week they're, they're gone. <laughs> What happened? you got to wonder. Jesus, now, I've got to get a caboose on this. Jesus... Well, turn to Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Are you still okay out there? Do you need to stand up and move around or anything? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. I've got to quickly move through this and then I've got one more and then we're done. I'll move quickly here, but it's needed to be said. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. It's a very glorious, wonderful verses. But he said, come unto me, all of you know this, but come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is not only that when we come to Christ it becomes restful, it's to be a lifestyle of rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It means my lifestyle should not be a burdened, grievous living. Now he's talking to the religious again, the ornaments of religion that the Pharisees had so laden the people with. We understand all of that. It also has to do with, if you take it, the principle of it is when a sinner, they are so heavy with sin, he liberates them. I'm amazed at how many people witness and they say something Jesus never said. I've heard so many Christians say this, it's so hard living for God. But the Bible never says that. It doesn't say you won't be persecuted, and I'll get to that in just a moment. 
But he never said living the lifestyle for God was hard. In Proverbs, he said, now listen, the way of the transgressor is hard. That's what he said. I remember a man when I was growing up would always testify. I remember it. And, and so you, you, we have to be careful what we say and what we do. Children are very impressionable. I was just a child, and I never forgot what this man would say. And he didn't say it just once. He said it repeatedly. He would testify, and he would get up, and he would say these words. And he would start out, and then he would say, I tell you, he said, it's just so hard living for God. Now, he was sincere, and he would, you know, he would get into it. He was sincere. And I always thought about that. I thought, you know, I don't know. I, Mom and Pop and my family, all my family was Pentecostal folk and saved, and I never really saw them struggle living for God. Oh, they faced adversity and all of those things, but they never really struggled to live for Him. And, and I, I thought, well, I don't know, there's a disconnect here somewhere, but I, I just, you know, I was a child growing up, and I'd never, I'd never forget it. And I couldn't figure out why was it so hard for him. And bless his heart. It was heartbreaking. Come to find out, the man was doing things that was sinful. It didn't come out till later on. Then, as I, when I got saved, I realized when I read the verse in Proverbs, the way of the transgressor is hard. It's hard trying to live for Christ when you're still living for the devil. It's miserable. It's miserable. Cut the ties. <laughs> Jesus never said it was hard living for him. In 1 Peter 5, 8, what did he say? He said, casting all your care upon him. Do you know why? For he careth for you. If you feel weight, throw it off on him. You feel burdened, throw it off on him. The only burden we should ever carry in this life, the only burden that Jesus says that we really should carry is a burden for the lost. That's it. One more thing and I'm done. And this carries on with that. Jesus never said we wouldn't suffer persecution. You say, well, why does, why, what do you mean? Look at John 15. I, I guess, get, let me give you these verses yet. John 15 and verse uh, 18. Now, while you're going through, stop at John 7. John 7, 7. John 7, 7. Be encouraged by what he says here. John 7, verse 7. The world, read with me, ready? The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify it that the works thereof are evil. John 15, 18. John 15, 18. And there's so many other verses, I, I know, but I, I just pick these out just for the moment. But 15, 18, ready? Let's read together. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You say, why is this in this li list? Because why are we in shock when we face persecution? It is a part of life. I should, and I'll speak for myself, why am I in shock when somebody lies on me? Don't be in shock when they lie on you. You are going to suffer persecution. But do you know what rectifies a lie that they spread about you? Keep living persistently for God and your long-lasting behavior will prove them wrong. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Lacey and I, when we were dating, and we did date, we didn't shack up. But anyhow, uh, but we, all right. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> when we were dating, now listen to this. Not the world, not the world. A Christian, was it a board member? A board member of a church leading person, Brother Matt, in a church, board member, not this church, or I wouldn't even pass, or yes it was, and a year I guess. And we were dating, and it wasn't in this church, but another church. And a board member began to spread, and it went like wildfire. And here's what was said. 
And I would proposed and we were getting married. And he said, do you know why them two are getting married? And of course, people said, why? Why? And the, <laughs> he said, because Lacey is pregnant. No foundation for it, nothing, uh, nothing at all. And this got back to us, and I thought, what? Where did that come from? And uh, so anyway, well, we knew it wasn't the case, of course, but, uh, you know, it's, well, anyway. <laughs> so this went like wildfire, and, oh, they're getting married because uh, she's pregnant. Well, you know, nine months came, and there, there was no baby. Well, then another nine months came and still no baby. Do you know it has... Oh, brother, I have now got to figure how long we've been married. Oh, 14 years. 14 years later, there's still no baby. Do you know now what those people realize? That guy lied. Just keep living for God. Your, your lifestyle will eventually put to silence the naysayers. <laughs> this church, and I'm done. My goodness, I hope your roast ain't burn up. But, but, but this church has suffered persecution unduly. You'd be surprised the rumors that have flew about this church. Totally unfounded. I've heard them too. I know, what's, I know what you hear. I hear things. I thought, what in the, where did that start? I'll, I'll give you an example. Now, there's others that are pretty bad, right, even at this moment. But there were at one time, there was a huge rumor going around that, that this church had a pastor from Washington, D.C. I was from D.C. Where did that come from? I have no idea. And it went all through the community. I was from Washington, D.C. And this church that all of you was all from Hagerstown. <laughs> Nobody bothered to go by and see all the PA tags. <laughs> that's just a small one. They, they're, that's light. You ought to hear some things that goes around now. I'm telling you, it's just unbelievable. What do you do? Lacey and I was just talking recently. I'll tell you what we do. Put your hands on the steering wheel and just keep going straight ahead. Huh? I'm done. Don't say amen. I'm done. <laughs>